Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Unlimited. Today, we are talking about silencing your inner critic. And I will start by acknowledging that my voice may be a little rough. It probably sounds more rough to me than it does to you, but I am getting over a cold that my kids very generously shared. (laughs) So one aspect of dealing with an inner critic is by saying it out loud, acknowledging it. So there you go. There's a little example, not that I have a great deal of criticism around it. However, (laughs) just to give examples. So we're actually talking about the topic of the inner critic, but we're not going to be silencing the inner critic. I have a bit of a different take than you may have heard previously from people who talk about telling the inner critic to shove off. And if you've been listening for a while, you probably have heard me engage the inner critic either through coaching episodes or just as part of some of the other topics, because it is such a part of our experience and the things that stop us from doing the things that we want to do. But it also plays an important role. It has a lot of information, just like emotions that we talked about the last three episodes. The inner critic has information for us, and it holds a lot of energy, obviously. You may have noticed in the way that it holds you back from doing things. That energy isn't energy to just tell to go in the closet and hide. It is energy that can be utilized when it is understood and engaged. So that's what we're going to be looking at in this episode. We're also going to touch a little bit on the societal dynamics, of course, though that's going to come up a bit later in the next episode when we're talking about imposter syndrome, because that really ties into some of the ways that we experience the inner critic or the places that we experience the inner critic that aren't actually about us. Little hint there as again, you've probably heard me talk about before. So what we are going to be exploring in this episode has to do with what the critic motivates, uncoupling it from your identity, understanding its purpose, five steps to shift the inner critic message, and the inner critic's relationship to shame and what shame is in our society, the role it plays in our society. So We have a lot to cover, as I'm sure you're not surprised. I do want to let you know before we dive in that I have a workshop coming up this lovely month of October on engaging the inner critic where you will have a supportive space to dig into the dynamics of that inner critic. In the workshop, you will take the mask off your inner critic and clear the way for developing a more supportive relationship The workshop uses a mix of group coaching and getting crafty to help you take charge of your inner dialogue and use the info your critic holds instead of having it hold you back. You will walk away with tools and awareness that will help create your biggest supporter out of your worst critic. The workshop is going to be held online and offered as a pay what you can with a suggested donation. So I will have the link to that in the show notes. If you happen to be listening to this after the workshop has been held, don't worry. I often have workshops, whether it is this one or other ones. So be sure to check out the resources page on my website where I have at the bottom listed workshops that are coming up and you are invited to register for any of them. So now, without further ado, let's get started. Hey there, I'm Valerie Friedlander, Certified Life Business Alignment Coach, and this is Unlimited. This podcast bridges the individual and the societal, scientific and spiritual, positive and negative, nerdy and no, there's just a lot of nerdy. (laughs) Come on board and let's unlock a life that's as badass as you are. I want to acknowledge as we get started that there are layers of inner critic. There are levels, layers. The inner critic is multifaceted. There are components of the inner critic that are extremely debilitating, that relate to specific childhood trauma and need support, or I would encourage support, from a trained professional like a therapist 
to dig in and do some healing work around that trauma. That said, there's also layers that we all experience from living in this society. And one could say from the trauma of living in this white supremacist, patriarchal, capitalist society. Anywho, I hesitate to use too much of the word trauma because because its overuse can create a sense of not being seen for people who have experienced direct specific trauma. And it can also create confusion for people who haven't experienced that in terms of understanding what's going on for them. I've had several people who are like, I've had a pretty happy childhood and like not a lot has happened. And I don't understand why I am struggling with this. So I want you to know as we get started that there are layers, there are levels, there are dynamics of the inner critic. And the first piece of this is to not judge the experience that you're having. You are having an experience for a reason. And we don't always have to understand why you're having that experience. Sometimes it's just noticing what the pattern is and going, okay, this is what's going on. This is the experience and releasing the need to understand the why of it. Just like how, why can feel too big, overwhelming. It can contain a lot of judgment in it and can kind of get us lost in the weeds. So I invite you to let go of the why for a little bit, as well as the how, and just be present to whatever is going on. The inner critic is generally created from some level of internalization of hurt. So whatever you want to call that, it's some level of hurt. When we are hurt, we learn the patterns of harm on both ends, both the victim end, the person receiving the hurt, and the victimizer end, the person perpetrating the hurt. As children, we develop coping mechanisms whereby it is unsafe to express the emotions and it is safer to turn them inward against myself to keep myself in check. So basically taking the victimizer role inward and doing it to oneself in order to keep oneself in check so that you cannot be harmed by the outside self. Now, again, we all have an inner critic voice and it is tied to shame. It is tied to certain cultural norms, one of which being that we have a cultural norm to believe that criticism will motivate behavior. So it could be that childhood internalization to keep oneself in check, to keep oneself safe and within the norms, whether it's familial norms, societal norms, or all of the above, to prevent pain, because shame and pain are very closely related. So it is a self-protection mechanism. It can also be this idea that if I just beat myself up enough, I will do the thing because there's that societal story that self-flagellation will get you to do the thing, which isn't actually true. Actually, that kind of criticism, that level of criticism is anxiety provoking. Now, for some people whose stress response tends to be more fight, it might push them into action. It might motivate a, well, I'll show them and and push action forward. Though that kind of action in a sustained space will create burnout. For most people, it's anxiety provoking, which leads to avoidance, which means that the inner critic isn't actually motivating, it is demotivating. However, we also often use it in order to cope with fear and especially things like fear of the unknown, places where we don't know what's going to happen, so we have to keep ourselves that much more in check to ensure that we don't break the rules or create a situation that is going to be painful or, you know, just don't go into it in the first place, which is usually where that ends up going. So hence why a lot of people are like, I want to do the thing, but I'm not doing the thing. Well, there's a good reason to not do the thing, and that is, well, danger or a sense of danger. Demystifying the unknown or creating smaller steps into it is a way that we engage actually moving forward. So in that respect, sometimes we can 
navigate around the inner critic, but it depends on what the situation is. It depends on what's being triggered. It depends on the layers of the inner critic message and what's going on. Oftentimes, the inner critic is rooted in some dynamic of not enoughness. And you've probably heard me talk about the idea of creating a definition around enough, which is one way that we demystify the space and create a more solid, secure foundation for whatever is being leaned into, which in some ways allows us to not have to deal so much with the inner critic because we've created a solid foundation and then we can create smaller stair steps and we can kind of like not set off the inner critic. If you think about like Halloween, it's like knowing where the sensor of the monster in the yard, the decoration is, and then not setting it off. So it's kind of like that. And that's one way that we can keep the motivation going as we step into something new. But that's not what we're talking about. (laughs) We're talking about actually engaging this inner critic. So, hey, we've set off the sensor. The monster is doing its thing. What it does when it goes off is creates those avoidant behaviors. Now, before we talk about the places where avoidance is not helpful, I want to make sure that we address the fact that sometimes avoidance can be helpful. And maybe it's temporary avoidance. Generally, it's going to be like temporary avoidance. But when someone's behaving in a harmful way, avoiding them makes sense. Now, when that behavior is triggering something inside of you, then that's where the power is for you to engage and look at. There are times when someone is behaving in a certain way that might not feel hurtful to one person, but does feel hurtful to another person because of past experiences and, you know, triggering that inner critic voice. It's helpful when you can take that space, and I talk a lot about the art of the pause, to take the space you need to check out what is mine and what is not mine. This relates a lot to boundaries that we're going to talk about next month. But when you can look at, okay, this is triggering something inside of me. It's not actually them, but a button in me that I'm then blaming them for pushing. (laughs) Also, it can be both, just a heads up there. So that's why it's helpful to kind of differentiate, well, what's mine, what's not mine? Sometimes when that dynamic is going on, there's like that level of control. I want to control the situation. So are you controlling yourself? Are you trying to control them? If it's focused outward, it can be trying to control them, replaying events, kind of playing a chess match in your brain. If I can just get it right, if I can just say the right thing to manage the situation. And that's generally an indication that there's there's something up. There's something going on there. Now, some other places of avoidance that aren't related to necessarily blame of another person or the dynamics of another person, but perhaps more related to an activity or something that you're trying to do, you can notice where that avoidance is coming up. So where a message might be playing when you're running into perfectionism, procrastination, those types of dynamics. And of course, perfectionism can be a form of procrastination. (laughs) So there's that. But that avoidance of the activity, oftentimes we don't necessarily notice the emotion. We don't even necessarily notice the messaging and the voice that's going on, the critic voice. We notice the behavior first. Oh, I'm not doing the thing. And so it takes kind of digging in and going, well, what's going on here? And excavating the underlying voice that is feeding your subconscious brain that message that then your subconscious brain goes, we're going to avoid that one. So that's something to notice. Also, one of the other things that we'll do is, especially if that message is really painful, and oftentimes it can get super painful in order to really put the brakes on us, there's an avoidance of self. There's an avoidance of our own thoughts, not just a behavior, but an avoidance of dealing with the dynamics, the emotional dynamics or the cognitive dynamics that are happening in our own brain. And that can lead to things like overeating, overworking, overdrinking, anything that keeps us out of our head and focused on something else. These are coping mechanisms However, obviously, they can go into an unhealthy space that's creating harm in other aspects of our health, in other aspects of our life. So being aware that these are indications that there's something underneath to be looked at. Not always is it helpful or healthy to look at these things by yourself. We are social creatures, and I'm going to be coming back to that a fair amount as I 
do. (laughs) It's important to remember that even though there are a lot of things that are things that we can only do ourselves that are our inner work, inner work doesn't mean alone work. Having support, having people to hold space for you, even just hold space for you. And I say just not in a minimizing way, but in a sometimes we tend to look for people to fix it or we find people who want to fix it. And it really is just holding space that is needed to engage in a safe way for us and for our own emotions. It's important to have that. The shame that that inner critic voice is triggering, that avoidance that it also motivates (laughs) or demotivates, is rooted in cultural norms. For example, think of this idea that we're innately sinners. We were born bad. Bad behavior is evidence of that identity. Whatever bad is labeled as, right, then that's also a whole nother thing. And then coupled with our tendency towards fixed mindset, the I made a mistake, therefore I am a mistake. I'm fighting my true nature. And so any evidence that my true nature is coming out, that I am this, whatever this is, can trigger all of that emotional stuff, all of the avoidant behaviors. So knowing that's part of what the inner critic is relating to. And it's very rooted in the cultural norms. And most of the stuff isn't stuff we consciously think about, as I said. We just do it. It's just what we do to the point that it is so normalized that we're not usually aware of it. It's just part of what we're struggling with. So this is where I would invite you to take a look at what are the I am statements that you tend to use? Just notice them. And that's the biggest piece is taking a minute periodically to notice when you say I am whatever, what is the whatever? What is it that you're saying? So take it outside of the I'm triggered or I have this voice or I'm procrastinating or I'm avoiding or I'm doing whatever. You can put it in there too. But even just outside of that, what are the statements that you say about yourself? What are those self-criticisms? that you tend to say. Noticing those is a first piece to starting to separate the story of yourself from your identity. And the story of yourself is part of what we're engaging. You know, the inner critic is trying to prevent us from committing a social faux pas, from being rejected, from being kicked out of the group, from being abandoned, which is extremely dangerous as well as extremely painful. So any of these self-criticisms, these are things that feed into how you are looking, how you're working internally to engage preventing other people from seeing you that way or addressing the dynamics of what that story about yourself looks like because we exist in relation to others. That's one of the fundamental pieces of who we are. We're communal creatures. Despite all of the programming that says we're supposed to be independent, which can be a whole nother thing and totally play into that inner critic voice. So separating from your identity. These are I am statements. These are stories that I tell about myself. They are not facts. They are stories. Now, there may be some that you have more of a connection to than others, but notice what you tend to repeat because what you tend to repeat, what tends to come out, there's a reason it came out there. There's a reason it is present. There's a reason you thought it. One flag here, try your best (laughs) not to beat yourself up over whatever the I am statement is. That can also create resistance to even noticing the I am statements because there can be shame and embarrassment around having them in the first place. Ah, so many layers. (laughs) So just notice, that's it. Go, oh, that's interesting. You just try that. So, you know, like emotions, we're noticing first. Having a conversation first starts with noticing and acknowledging. In one of the emotions episodes, I talked about like the first part of starting to notice emotions is having, you know, they come in the room and you're like, oh, look, and then you acknowledge and then you engage in conversation. We don't just jump to starting to talk and there's nobody there. (laughs) We want to be like, oh, there, I see you. And the reason it helps to consider these I am statements is... The more familiar you are with the story, as well as where the story shows up, the more easily you'll notice when that story comes into the room and takes a seat. 
and ideally before it starts rearranging the furniture (laughs) and stopping you from doing the things. So noticing it first. Then we have five steps to silence the voice or how I like to say, retrain it. One, we just covered, which is noticing the self-criticism, noticing the voice. Two, say it in second person, like you're talking to somebody else. This is where you'll say it and you're like, wow, that is super mean. It is often where people will end. And this is, I mentioned this being a little bit different of an approach. Oftentimes people are like, it's just bad. Just tell it to shove off. Talk to it the way you would talk to somebody who said that directly to you. I am encouraging you not to do that because it, as I mentioned, it is there for a reason. It is trying to protect you from something. It is trying to keep you safe. There is a reason it is showing up. Now, whether that reason is actually needed is not the point yet. (laughs) It is first acknowledging it. So step three is what is the purpose of the voice? Why is it here? What's going on that it's showing up? Now, this isn't why is it here from originally? This is like, what is it trying to hold you back from? What is the purpose of holding you back from whatever it is? I mean, and it may even be uncovering, like, what is it that I'm avoiding? Because sometimes you can notice you have avoidant behaviors and you're like, what am I avoiding? And you'll be like, what's the message behind this avoidance? And then you can engage, okay, what what's the dynamic here? What's the pattern? Usually there's a fear that at least at one point was a real one. Maybe it's from childhood. Maybe it dates all the way back there. Maybe it's from an experience or several experiences that happened that were really powerful or big or impactful. What is it doing? What is it trying to tell you? And then four is, what is the truth? This is where you get to go, okay, is this real in the moment? Is this present now? Like, is this fear and the danger that I am experiencing, that sense of danger that I'm experiencing, is it rooted in the present moment? And being helpful, pointing out something that actually needs to be navigated? Because that can be the case, right? Like, there can be, oh, there's a person here that is unsafe for me in terms of the dynamics that we have going on. I don't like to say toxic person because that labels them. And it's all about the relationship between the two of you and whether it is helpful and healthy or if it is harmful and triggering. So is this actually coming up for a reason or is it displaced and generalized from a past experience or societal stories or whatever? So what is the truth here. And what do you need to know to find out what the truth is? Because maybe you're not sure. So maybe more information is needed. And then five, acknowledge what it's trying to do. Have a conversation to it. Like we separated it out and said the the message external, said the message in second person. Create yourself a little inner critic to talk to. Create yourself a little figure, get a little figure, something to represent that inner critic, especially if you've noticed a common theme, a pattern in what that message is, whatever that I am not enough statement is have a little figure have something that you can kind of separate from yourself like a sub subset of you (laughs) that you can talk to I mean like thanks for trying to protect me I really appreciate that I really appreciate you pouring your energy to trying to keep me safe however what you're saying is not actually helpful right now and I would much rather you use your energy this way would you tell me this give me this information I kind of like to think of the inner critic as being like a baby who's just learning to talk, who's only been taught to say one thing. You know, a baby's like, mama, mama, and everyone is mama. The inner critic is kind of like that. Anything that's dangerous is you're a terrible person. You're not enough, whatever it is, whatever that message is. That's what it was trained to say. So now you get to start going, hey, I would rather you say this and essentially teach it to say something else. Now, that doesn't mean it's not going to say what it's used to saying because it is been doing it probably for a while. But when you can notice it, you can understand what is the message it's trying to give me? What is it actually saying? What's the purpose? What is the truth? And then this is actually more helpful based in the actual truth. Then that allows you more power, more choice, more engagement. It separates the I am from you and recognizes it as a facet of your experience, which isn't who you are. It informs who you are, 
but you have more power over who you are than that. It isn't fixed. It's something that you can continue to feed into with different choices and different ways of engaging. I want to give you an example of where the message can show up and how, you know, it doesn't always have to be this big production of engaging the inner critic. That can be a helpful process, especially when it's coming up a lot or it's very present in a particular area. But sometimes it really is just connecting a dot to an emotional charge or resistance so that you can expand the options that you can perceive or the way that you show up so that it's your adult self that's showing up rather than your child self. This did come up actually in the last coaching session that I did as a recorded session. It also has come up with clients who are wanting to be visible in their business but are struggling with that visibility and sometimes it's blocking them putting themselves out there Sometimes it's creating an emotional charge when they do put themselves out there and they don't get the immediate feedback that is reassuring. So for example, this message that is, what if they see me and they still don't want me? And this has come up for clients when they put themselves out there, they did a big activity and then they didn't get a response immediately. And the messaging that, well, now they see me and they still don't want me. And that usually is related to something that happened as a young person where they felt rejected from a group, can be family, can be other kids, whatever it is, but this sense of being rejected. And then, of course, the inner critic is like, ooh, see, you're not enough. So either blocking the initial action or popping up to trigger an emotional charge when the evidence is present. So rather than allowing the inner critic to go, look at this evidence, it's taking care of the self that was hurt by that in the past and looking at what is true in the present moment. And oftentimes it has to do with maybe the message wasn't quite right yet and it needs some evolving. Maybe it's an expectation that things will happen faster than they do or that other people will make decisions faster than they do. Whatever. There are lots of reasons. The adult you can go, okay, now what do we do? What do I need to know? What's the information so that I can do the next action? But the little you, the one that the inner critic was charged to protect and may either be protecting such that you don't put yourself out there or may be even louder because of that failure to protect, quote unquote, failure to protect such that you did the thing and then got hurt. And then it completely freaks out to be able to go, hey, you didn't fail. I chose to take this action and it's going to be okay. It hurt before. We were little and, you know, have a conversation about what happened. Care for the little Mm -hmm. you that is having a tantrum and didn't have that support that she needed at the time to be okay, who had to turn it inward and create that inner critic. Talk to her. Care for her. We're not putting her in the corner. (laughs) We're not saying, no, that's bad. We're going, hey, you're here for a reason. You're getting loud. You're throwing a tantrum for a reason. And... That reason isn't present anymore, but I know that it hurt before. As you've heard me talk about so many times, it's caring for yourself versus trying to control yourself. We are conditioned to shame ourselves into being a certain way to fit in with the norms of our society, and it's not healthy. They're not healthy. But we are social creatures, and so it's natural for us to do that. I want to give you another example that I came across when I was doing some research for this episode. Psych Central had a whole write-up on working with your inner critic. And of course, I'll have all the links in the show notes. The person who wrote this article used an example that I'm going to share with you. And I'm going to tell you my issue with this example. The example is that Jessica went shopping. She didn't know her sizes at this store and tried on a few things. She thought, ugh, these clothes are tight. They don't fit. I feel like such a failure. I'm so fat and ugly. What is she afraid of? Quote, I've gained weight, which means I'm a failure. It means I'm old. I'm ashamed and scared of getting older and gaining more weight. 
What authentic feelings might she be having about the situation that aren't related to shame triggers? What are her vulnerabilities? Identify your vulnerability and feel those feelings. Jessica says, quote, I feel out of control, fear, grief, loss. My body is reacting differently than it did in the past. It's harder to maintain weight and muscle tone. It feels hopeless. I feel afraid, overwhelmed. What do you really need? Jessica says, quote, I can deal with it. Acknowledging my vulnerability prompts me to take better care of my health. When I feel worthless, there's no hope at all. Shame is not motivating. So if you've been listening to me for a little while, again, <laughs> you probably already see some of the flags that I might point to. But what I want to address here is this process is important. However, what is missing from this assessment is the societal component of shaming. And this is the next piece that I want to tap into briefly, because we're going to dig more into it in the next episode, is that messaging and the rules and the norms that the shame is upholding. So the feelings are feelings that definitely deserve space to acknowledge and engage. Feeling out of control, fear, grief, loss, as your body shifts is totally understandable. Most of us experience that. Likewise, the desire to enjoy your body and feel good in your body. What is missing in this assessment is the societal influence of the messaging of the story of what is acceptable and why that sense of fear might be present. It's not just a response to a changing body. It is a response to real societal conditions that can lead to being rejected and becoming unsafe in the world that we exist in. So this is where, again, I really encourage you, don't shove your inner critic in the corner. She is there because she has something she wants you to look at. What she is pointing to and the words that she is using are often unhelpful. They relate to some internalization of something and over a generalization, but that doesn't mean that there's not something real to look at. As I've said before, and I will say again, mindset is everything but not everything is mindset. And this is a great example of that, where shifting your mindset about something in terms of how you look at yourself and what you feel like you have access to and where you feel like you have power and can engage in choice to have that power, even if it's just looking at something differently, is important. It doesn't change everything, though. Fat phobia in our society, body shaming in our society, anti-aging in our society, all of those things are real things that can limit access to spaces, to resources, to choices. Shifting your mindset about what's going on and looking at it from an adult perspective can help you navigate those situations to find what you need to be able to be okay, to be able to take care of yourself or be taken care of as needed, taking it out of the internalized messaging allows the space for that awareness. So that's part of the mindset piece. It doesn't change the societal piece, but it allows you to engage the societal piece with more power. It's also important to recognize that all of these dynamics are based in our relationships. Our identity is in relation. So while we do need to take out that piece of like, I am these things, separate those from that internalized narrative, we naturally are going to be impacted by other people. Our identity is in relation. We are part of a society. A while back, I mentioned the film In and of Itself on Hulu, which I think is a great exploration of that aspect of relationship and who we are. We are not meant to be fully self-validated. So if you are impacted by other people and a perceived rejection or a real rejection, that is normal. And there is nothing wrong with you. We do need validation from external to ourselves as well. So if your inner critic is screaming, part of what it might be saying is you need people around you to lift you up and support you. And that's okay. We're going to dig into some of those 
relational dynamics more next episode when we talk about dealing with imposter syndrome. So definitely stay tuned for that if you are interested in digging further into the inner critic and your own relationship to that inner critic. I encourage you to check out the workshop that I have coming up on the inner critic. I will have a link to it in the show notes. Please reach out if you have any questions or anything that you'd like me to dig into further. I love to hear from you. And with that, I will talk to you all next time. Thanks for listening. I so appreciate you being here. If you got something out of today's episode, please share it. Leave me a review, take a screenshot and post it on social with a shout out to me. Send it to a friend or, you know, all of the above. Want to hang out more? Join me on Instagram or better yet, Get on my mailing list to make sure you don't miss out on anything. And remember, your possibilities are as unlimited as you are. Allow yourself to shine, my friend. The world needs your light. See you next time.